Okay, and as you stretch and then sit down, I will start talking. So I am a general pediatrician. It's a huge honor to be here today. I told some colleagues that I was coming to Guam for a work trip, and they were like, no, no, no. How do you get to go to Guam to, to give a talk and just call that a work trip? The island is so beautiful, and so it's really a wonderful experience um, being here. So I want to particularly thank Dr. Sanchez, who wrote a grant to the American Academy of Pediatrics and was able to get a visiting lectureship, and that's how I'm, I'm um, able to be here today. So huge thanks to you for doing it. It's really an honor to be here today. Um, and I get to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is reducing secondhand smoke exposure in children. Um, I became interested in this because I do a lot of work with asthma. And as you all know, when you work with kids with asthma, there are so many things that we are unable to change about their environment that might trigger their asthma. But actually, smoking and secondhand smoke exposure is one big thing that parents, I think, are pretty open to changing and something that we as pediatricians can support them in. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about how we do that in Oakland and San Francisco. So the objectives for today are right here. I want to talk about the impact of tobacco use on families. And I think you guys probably know a lot about that. So we'll go through that quickly. I want to talk about some ways in which child health practices can effectively treat tobacco users in families describe how we can implement this program called CEASE, which stands for the Clinical Effort Against Secondhand Smoke Exposure, talk about how we can um, implement that in both clinics and hospital settings, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about Tobacco 21, just because I know that's very relevant to all of us here today, and then I am also going to touch on e-cigarettes, because I think these days we can't talk about smoking without mentioning e-cigarettes. It's not one of my great areas of expertise, but I certainly know a lot about it, having worked with lots of youth who are vaping these days. All right, um, so I wanted to start with this slide just to open us up because I think it's pretty astounding to me that even today, 50 years, more than 50 years after that landmark Surgeon General's report was released in 1964 talking about how bad smoking is for our health, even today smoking is the number one cause of preventable disease in the United States. And you can see that it dwarfs all of these other causes of, sorry, <laughs> that was all supposed to be on the same slide. It dwarfs all these other causes of preventable diseases combined. So obesity, drugs, homicide, MBAs, add all of those up, and they still don't come close to this 500 pound gorilla in the room when it comes to causes of death. Now secondhand smoke, so we said that 480,000 people die every single year from tobacco use. Secondhand smoke causes 40,000 deaths each year, and 400 of those deaths are infants who die from sudden infant death syndrome. So this is something that we should be talking about and that we need to be talking about. These are some of the things that make secondhand smoke so dangerous. You can read the list yourself, so I won't read it to you, but know that there are <coughs> over 7,000 chemicals found in secondhand smoke, and over 70 of them are known to be carcinogenic. So when parents are smoking around their kids, we know that it's just a toxic milieu that they're creating. I want to point out also that um, parents want the best thing for their kids, right? And no one is stupid. Everybody knows that secondhand smoke is bad for their children. And so I, I really, and in talking with lots of people about addiction and about smoking and smoking around children, I really believe that parents want the best thing for their kids. We know 70% of smokers want to quit smoking. And the problem is that nicotine is just so addictive. It's as addictive as heroin and cocaine. You have both a very powerful physical addiction from nicotine as well as a very powerful behavioral addiction. When you smoke and you expose your brain to all that nicotine, you're actually upregulating the number of nicotine receptors in your brain. So your brain is just craving more and more nicotine. And so we need to be able to do more than just say like, oh yeah, you smoke, by the way, you should quit smoking, I'll see you next time you bring your child in for a well check. We have to be able to do more than that to help parents. But this slide I'm just gonna put up here briefly, this is from the Surgeon General's report from 2015, um, linking some of the um, diseases that we see both in children and adults to secondhand smoke exposure. So we see things like sudden infant death syndrome in children, impaired lung function, coughing, wheezy, early, um, early wheezes in children, in, sorry, in infants is linked to secondhand smoke exposure, middle ear disease, and then with adults, coronary artery, lung cancer, stroke. Um, there is um, not enough evidence to be causal, but very close to that in terms of looking at things like asthma, learning disability, and hyperactivity, and ADHD, which we were talking about earlier this afternoon. In addition, for those of you who work in a hospital setting, we also know that children who are exposed to secondhand smoke have worse hospital outcomes and longer lengths of stay. So we know that when kids go to the PICU, if they have secondhand smoke exposure, 
their odds of going to the PICU are actually higher than kids who don't have secondhand smoke exposure. Their odds of being intubated are higher, and they have a longer length of stay, as I said. They also have a greater risk of intubation, a 22-fold higher risk of intubation for kids with asthma. They have higher readmission rates, and you can read all of these yourselves. But it's very clear that secondhand smoke poses a tremendous problem to those of us who are working with inpatients as well. And so why should we care? I think you guys are all probably familiar with this information, but Guam has the highest youth smoking rate in the United States. So 20% of youth in Guam are smoking. That's actually higher than the, um, than the overall smoking rate for the United States. So in the US, 17% of adults are smokers. But in Guam, 20% of youth are smokers. Almost 30% of adults are smokers, which is incredibly high. Um, this, this information is from peaceguam.org. Every day, at least one person on Guam dies from tobacco use. 66% of Guam students are exposed to secondhand smoke, and over 60% of smokers want to quit smoking. So my question is, what are we doing? As pediatricians who are seeing kids in our clinic and seeing kids when they're admitted to the hospital, what is it that we are doing to help children? We talked about secondhand smoke. I wanted to briefly bring up thirdhand smoke. Have people heard of thirdhand smoke before? Good, okay, great. I used to give this talk and nobody knew what that was, so this is good that people know. Um, third hand smoke, so if I'm smoking a cigarette and you're breathing in that smoke, that second hand smoke, right? But once I put that cigarette out, you have this cloud of toxins that's left in the air, and those toxins are absorbed into the environment, so into the carpet, into the walls, into the drapery, into the furniture, and then over weeks to months to even years, that stuff is re-emitted, and it reacts with normally occurring compounds in the air to form tobacco-specific nitrosamines, which are also carcinogenic. And so the, um, the photograph on, the, on your right over here is a picture taken from an apartment from a woman who died of smoking-related illnesses. She was a long-time smoker. When they went to empty out her apartment, you can see that kind of tacky, sticky residue that's left on the wall, and that's an example of third-hand smoke. Now, there's a lot of research being done about third-hand smoke and trying to understand, well, is it just that it smells bad and it's not that, you know, it's, it's sort of annoying to us, or does it actually have some real health impacts? And unfortunately, we're learning it has some real health impacts. So at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab up in Northern California, near where I'm from, there's been research where they've been able to take the milieu of toxins that are found in third-hand smoke. They expose developing human liver cells to those toxins, and they see widespread damage to the human DNA in those liver cells. And then um, uh, Dr. Martins Green at UC Riverside is working with mice models and exposing mice to third-hand smoke and is finding that mice who are exposed to third-hand smoke have elevated lipid levels, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, poor wound healing, and hyperactivity. So certainly there is a lot, this is a very active area of research right now, but I think the take-home point from this is that we really want to protect our children, everybody, but especially our children, from second and third-hand smoke. And so the program that I've been working with to do this um, through the American Academy of Pediatrics is called CEASE, and that's for the Clinical Effort Against Secondhand Smoke Exposure. CEASE was started in Boston in 2005 by a pediatrician named Jonathan Winnikoff, and if you're interested in this topic, Dr. Winnikoff has published quite a bit on second and third hand smoke. Um, and Dr. Winnikoff was a pediatrician, and uh, he still is, and he was just getting, and many of you might have had this experience, where he was getting frustrated because he would have parents bringing their kids into his clinic, and the child would be coughing, and the child would maybe be coming in with an asthma flare, and the parent was a smoker, and Dr. Winnikoff was like, I can treat the asthma, but what am I gonna do about the smoking? Because that's one of the big triggers here, and as a pediatrician, I just don't know what to do about that. And so he developed a training program that we now have been able to do some research on and scale um, in, uh, so I've been working with First Five California to bring this program to the entire state of California, and now with the AAP, we're trying to spread the model more widely because it's a relatively easy model to implement in clinic. And I have to get a shout out to Mike and Amanda in the back. Um, we were at Children's Oakland together and Mike and Amanda have been able to um, work with this program as well. Children's Oakland was one of the first hospitals in California to really adopt this CEASE model. And the first year that we really started doing CEASE at Children's Hospital Oakland, we were responsible for 19% of the referrals to the state quit line which just so shows that if you have a systematic process for identifying kids exposed to secondhand smoke and then a plan for what to do with them, you can actually help a lot of families. The program has been studied by Dr. Winnikoff and by others, um, and I just put this up there to say that when we look at practices that are using the CEASE model, and I'll talk in more detail about what that is, 
But when, practice, when we look at practices who are using the CEASE model, we see that there are improvements and assistance provided to parents to quit smoking, more quit line referrals, more smoking cessation medications provided, and the intervention is sustained over time, which is good news. And so what are, how do we implement CEASE? What does it mean to, to do CEASE? So these are, this is where I always feel like a salesman. There are three easy steps to implement CEASE. <laughs> <laughs> the first one is ask. The second is assist, and the third one is to connect. So ask, when we talk about asking, we talk about doing universal screening for secondhand smoke exposure. And a lot of clinics and practices already do this. Um, what, we, what that means is when a child comes into the clinic, we ask whether anyone is using tobacco who lives with or cares for that child. We started also using this on our inpatient wards at UCSF, and so now when a child's admitted for any reason, in addition to the whole barrage of questions that the nurses ask on their admin, questionnaire, they also ask about secondhand smoke exposure. The second step, and I'm gonna go into, I'm gonna drill down on each of these a little bit more, but just for the overview. The second step is that the clinician prescribes nicotine replacement therapy. And that means that we actually give the parent medication to help them quit smoking, and I'll talk more about that. We also use motivational interviewing, some brief motivational interviewing techniques to explore some of the ambivalence around quitting <laughs> smoking and just to help make the um, help uh, move the person closer to being interested in quitting if at that moment they're just not interested in quitting. And then the third step is connecting the patient to the health, to, sorry, <laughs> to the smoker's helpline. And here in Guam you have 1-800-QUIT-NOW. Um, Liz from Public Health is out, the, out in the hallway over there and she's got a lot of information on 1-800-QUIT-NOW. But I, like many of you, work in a very busy practice. I work in a federally qualified health center at Children's Oakland. I also work at San Francisco General Hospital's clinic. We see tons and tons of patients. I don't have time to spend 20 minutes counseling someone on quitting smoking. So I really see the connection with the smoker's helpline as a really, really important link in order to help to carry the work on, carry on the conversation that I have started with that person. So I think that pediatricians are actually the best people to talk with adults about quitting smoking for a couple of reasons. One is that we have access to parents. So we see a newborn baby, when a child is born, we see that family up to 10 times in that child's first year of life if you're an outpatient clinician, right? If that's your primary care patient, they come in for their newborn check, maybe they come in for a weight check, they're two months, they're four months, they're six months, blah, 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 on and on. And so even if that parent is like, yeah, it's Christmas is coming, I'm kind of stressed about money, I, I need my cigarettes to like, take the edge off, I'm not ready to talk about this right now. And then I say, that's okay, is it okay if we talk about it two months from now when you come back in to see me? So we have multiple opportunities to form a relationship and to have uh, this conversation. The second reason I think that we are ideally situated to have this conversation is that parents, young healthy people tend not to go to the doctor. I won't ask you to raise your hands, but probably many of you have not been to see your own primary care provider in a, in a little while, right? But parents bring their kids in to see us every time we ask them to. And so we have this opportunity to be the doorway to the healthcare system for an adult who might just not have seen their own doctor for no good reason, but for you know a couple of years. The third reason is that those of you who are parents or who have worked in pediatrics, as all of you have, you know that parents will do just about anything for their kids. And so having a conversation with a smoker that's like, hey, in 30 years you might develop lung cancer is really different than me having a conversation with a parent whose child's an asthmatic and we're talking about increasing the child's asthma meds because their flares are becoming more and more frequent. And if I talk about reducing one of the triggers like secondhand smoke around the child so that maybe we don't have to go up on the asthma medication that conversation is really different, and parents are, I think, really open and willing to have that conversation where the other conversation might feel sort of adversarial and confrontational. And so now to drill down deeper into those three steps. So the first step is to ask. And it's this very simple principle that we can't help parents quit smoking and we can't help to protect kids from secondhand smoke exposure if we don't know if it's there. So the first thing we wanna do is screen for secondhand smoke exposure. And so we do this by treating secondhand smoke exposure like a vital sign. So whenever a child comes in, if a child's admitted to the hospital or if they come into their clinic, whenever they come in, we treat it like a vital sign. We do, you know, we do blood pressure, heart rate, temperature, and then we ask about secondhand smoke exposure. 
And the way that we ask is, does the child live with anyone or are they cared for by anyone who smokes cigarettes? We used to say, does anyone smoke around Katie? And what do you think happened when we did that? <laughs> no, why? Because <laughs> we smoke outside, exactly. So um, phrasing it in this way and helping to make it clear that we're asking if, if anyone who lives with the child is smoking cigarettes is a way to get at that information and so potentially to get at the, the third hand smoke issue as well. The second piece is to assist. And so this is where we want to use brief motiva motivational interviewing techniques. And sometimes when I say that, people are like, oh my god, I don't have time to do motivational interviewing. I only have five minutes with people. And when I, so when I say using motivational interviewing techniques, I really mean approaching this with a non-adversarial, non-confrontational manner, meeting the parents where they're at. If they're like, step off, I do not want to talk about this today, then I say, that's fine, let's talk about it another day. Just know that if you're ever interested in quitting, I'm here to help you and I can offer you medication and a referral. And that's it, and then I move on. And I've often actually had people say, actually, if you can offer me medication, then I'll take the medication. So sometimes just being open like that does open doors to people to have the conversation with you. The second piece is to offer nicotine replacement therapy. How many of you have prescribed nicotine replacement therapy before? <laughs> yes, my ringers. <laughs> Great. So ART is really easy to prescribe. I'm going to talk about how to do that next. Okay, so why prescribe nicotine replacement therapy? I think that's the first question. Because NRT is actually available over the counter, right? So anyone could walk into, what are your local drugstores? I usually say walk into Walgreens, but <laughs> what are the stores? Mega drug. Mega drug, okay. So anyone can walk into Mega Drug and be like, I would like some NRT, and they can just buy it themselves over the counter. That's not sufficient if we really want to help someone get access to nicotine replacement therapy for a couple of reasons. Um, so the, with a prescription, NRT is covered by insurance. And for a family that's experiencing financial difficulty, and we know that families who are living at or below the federal poverty level are much more likely to be smokers. For a family who has financial difficulty, going out to spend $100 on nicotine replacement therapy for the month just may not be an option. And so offering a prescription to them can take away that financial burden. It can also help with dosing. Sometimes the NRT might be difficult to figure out for people if they're not used to thinking about dosing. And so by us writing it out for them, it just makes it a little bit easier. And the third reason is I think there's something important about this concept of the provider mandate to the patient. So if there's a big difference between me, you know, finishing up my visit, walking out the door, and being like, oh, by the way, don't forget to buy that NRT so that we, you can, you know, so you can work on that and we'll talk about your smoking next time versus me actually handing a prescription to someone and saying, here's a prescription for nicotine replacement therapy. I think it's important for your child's health and for your health that you do this. It's a different level of investment, I think, in the relationship, and I think that parents feel that. Um, I had a, a patient at CHO uh, just a couple months ago where the, uh, it was a mom and her son, and the mom was a single mom. She was going through a lot. And the resident had been in the room and then came back out and was presenting to me and said, um, oh, and mom smokes. And I said, oh, did you talk about quitting smoking? And he said, no, no, I didn't really know what to say. So we went in, I said, okay, great, let's do it together. So we went in together and we had the con I had the conversation with the mom to model it for the residents so and he could hear what I, how I approached the situation. Um, and the mother, when I offered her nicotine replacement therapy, she actually started to cry. And she said, I've wanted to quit for years, but no one's ever offered me help, and I didn't know how. And it was so, she, she gave the resident a hug, she gave me a hug, <laughs> and I was like, it's like I planted you here. <laughs> that resident's gonna remember that forever. But I think it's, it's offering help to people who may not have another way to get that help that's so powerful with this. Okay, so you may be wondering, okay, but hold up, all that sounds great, patients crying, hugging, you know, all that sounds good, but, if I'm not the actual physician of record for that parent, how can I write a prescription for them, right? And that is, that is a fair question. Um, and so it's important for us to know, I think, that both the American Academy of Pediatrics and the American Medical Association think that this is a good idea. They think that when someone who is a healthcare provider, even though I might not be your healthcare provider, if I know that you're smoking and your secondhand smoke is affecting my patient, the AAP and the AMA both say it's a good idea for you to do something about that. If you think about it, you probably have prescribed medications for parents 
for other reasons, right? For meningitis prophylaxis or for pertussis prophylaxis or for scabies, right? We kind of do this all the time. I think we hesitate a little bit because we don't usually prescribe nicotine replacement therapy, so it makes us a little bit more nervous. I think the other reassuring thing is that NRT is available over the counter. So all you're doing is prescribing an over-the-counter medication to someone to take away the financial burden so that you can get the secondhand smoke out of your patient's environment. So I encourage you to consider starting to do this, and I'm going to talk about how to prescribe nicotine replacement therapy. It's really easy. The other great thing, though, I'll say is that your quit line, 1-800-QUIT-NOW, does send free NRT out to people. So if you are like, I get what she's saying, I know I should talk about this, but I'm like, I would never write a prescription for NRT for an adult that I don't know, then you could have, make sure that that person has the 1-800-QUIT-NOW phone number and they can call the quit line and they can get free NRT from the quit line. So that's another option that many states don't have, but you guys have that, so that's great. Okay, so how to prescribe NRT. This is the easiest prescribing you will ever do. So basically the idea with nicotine replacement therapy, it, you wanna do exactly what the name says. You want to replace the nicotine that they get from the cigarettes, right? And it couldn't be any easier because one cigarette gives you about one milligram of nicotine. So how many cigarettes are in a pack of cigarettes? 20. 20, excellent. So how many milligrams of nicotine? This is a harder question. <laughs> how many milligrams of nicotine do you need to replace? How many packs a day do you smoke? <laughs> oh, good question. For a pack a day smoker. 20 milligrams. Excellent, perfect. That's it. So that's it. You've just done your dosing. <laughs> Um, and luckily for nicotine replacement therapy, we have a couple of different forms which I'll talk about, but the patches come in 21, 14, and 7 milligram strengths. I don't know why they chose these multiples of 7, but basically for a pack-a-day smoker who needs 20 milligrams of nicotine replaced in a day, you're going to start with the 21 milligram patch. It's much easier than mix per kilo dosing that we, that we do in other, um, in other parts of our lives. So we have the patch and then we also have the gum available. The idea with the patch is that it provides a relatively constant level of nicotine over 24 hours. And then the gum is there for breakthrough. So the gum or the lozenge, um, which I don't have on this slide, but the gum and the lozenge are dosed the same. They come in two milligram or four milligram strengths and those are for breakthrough cravings. So if you think about um, a smoke, someone who's a smoker who wants to quit and they're a pack a day smoker, so they put on the patch in the morning you wear the patch for 24 hours and then you take it off and you put a new patch on a hairless piece of skin, you rotate sites every 24 hours. But you can imagine if someone's a pack a day smoker and they're like, I always smoke my cigarette at 10 o'clock because that's when the break is and then my friends and I go out and we smoke together. And so they have their patch on and it's like 9.45 and then it's like 9.50 and they're looking at the clock and then even though they have the patch on, they're starting to get more cravings, right? Because it's, it's about that time and they see their friends starting to get up and move outside. So that's when something like the gum is very helpful because it gives you a little bit of a boost of nicotine when you need a little bit more than what the patch is giving you. The um, challenge that I always tell families with is um, the way that cigarettes work, they're actually beautifully engineered to be mechanisms of addiction. Does anyone know how long it takes when you're smoking a cigarette for nicotine to get to your brain? Seconds. Seconds, yeah. You should be giving this talk. <laughs> it takes eight seconds for that nicotine hit to get to your brain, right? So we all have seen the images or have done it ourselves where you're smoking and then you kind of, you sort of relax, right? When you're chewing the gum, any ideas of how long it, the, the nicotine from the gum takes to get to your brain? 20, 30 minutes. It's like 15 minutes, right? So that's not helpful because you're watching your buddies go out for a smoke break and you're like, I need some nicotine and it's not coming. And then it just makes you want to smoke even more. So when I talk to patients about this, I say, so just know that it takes a little bit longer for the nicotine from the gum to get to your brain. So if you anticipate that at 10 o'clock you might have a craving because that's when your friends go out, then just be aware that you should start chewing your gum at 9.50. That obviously doesn't always work, but I think a little bit of anticipatory guidance like that is helpful just so people are aware that they're not going to chew the gum and immediately get it to their brain. The other thing about the gum is that when you chew, it's not like regular gum, when you chew it, so if you chew regular gum, you chew, swallow your spit, you chew, swallow your spit. If you do that with nicotine gum, you're going to get a stomach ache and feel nauseous and they're going to be like, that darn doctor, they gave me nausea, my stomach hurts now. It's because you're swallowing all this nicotine. So with nicotine gum, what you're supposed to do is you chew until it gets tingly, and then you park it in your cheek. 
And the tingliness means that the nicotine is coming out of the gum and being absorbed into your buccal mucosa. Once it stops tingling, then you chew it again, and then it gets tingly again, and you park it again. So if you don't remember all of that, just remember chewing nicotine gum is different than chewing regular gum, and then you can always look it up or have them make the package insert if that's helpful. And then the third point here, so you've got your nicotine patch, you've got your nicotine gum or your lozenge. The lozenge um, is you suck on it like a regular lozenge, and it's helpful if people have poor dentition caries, if they've got TMJ issues and they can't chew, chew, chew. So the, the lozenge is nice for that. And then you wean down over three to four months. So there's no great science to how you wean down. We like to sometimes have these very specific strategies on dosing and, and weeks and days and that kind of thing. For this, it's just whenever they start feeling fewer cravings, then they can try going down to a lower strength of the patch. So it's 21 to 14 to seven and then off. And then they can stay on the gum or the lozenge as needed. We, so we were talking earlier in uh, California, just about all of our prescriptions are through the EHR. So actually prescribing nicotine replacement therapy for parents can be challenging because if Demetrius's dad isn't in my EHR, then I can't e prescribe NRT for him. So the workaround that we've come up with, I like what you said about pediatricians breaking rules, because we do this. <laughs> the workaround that we've come up with is we've created these pre-printed prescriptions that have all of the dosing information on them and you just check, check, check and sign it and that then they're good to go. So you don't have to spend all the time writing out, you know, 21 milligram, 14 milligram, seven milligram, the gum and all of that. Um, I have a, I brought a bunch of NRT prescriptions that are by Charlie over there in the back. And um, I also, we also have flash drives for you guys. If you grab one of those, or if you go to our website, you can download a prescription and use that. I don't know how insurance works here, as obviously, as well as I do in California, but this is a watermarked paper. We need to use this for some of our Medi-Cal insurance companies, but other ones just accept paper, so you guys know that better than I do. Uh, but if you are able to just use plain paper, then feel free to download from the website. Okay, a few couple things about prescribing nicotine replacement therapy, just a few quick things to know. Uh, if someone's had a heart attack in the past two weeks because nicotine is a vasoactive substance, I would be a little wary about prescribing NRT and I would hope that they had a cardiologist and I would <laughs> ask them to go back to that person to talk about quitting smoking. If they've had a heart attack in the past two weeks, then they should be plugged in. If they're having worsening arrhythmia or chest pain, again, I wouldn't give them a vasoactive substance. I would encourage them to quit smoking and go see their doctor. If they have a severe skin condition, the adhesive from the patch can cause eczema or psoriasis to sort of worsen. Um, and so just be aware that if they've, got a, if they've got a very bad skin condition, you just want to be careful about using the patch because of the adhesive. And if someone is pregnant or breastfeeding, we suggest, I suggest using the gum only. I also suggest that they go talk to their OB because the OBs have done, I, I'm not a pregnancy and smoking cessation expert. Other people are, but I defer to their OB to help figure out the best way to help them quit smoking. Obviously, smoking is a huge risk factor for poor pregnancy outcomes, and so we want them to quit smoking. It's great that you're talking about it, um, and, and the OBs will know more about how to treat them. If someone is like, I get this question all the time, what if I put on like four patches and then go smoke like three cigarettes at the same time? How am I gonna feel? The answer is you're gonna feel like crap. You're gonna feel like that and stop doing it. That's too much nicotine. The, the problem rarely is that people use too much NRT. You know, what if they're, if they're like, well, I smoke 12 cigarettes a day, so then the 14 wasn't enough, so I'm gonna go with the 21 milligram patch. But if that, you know, if they feel all of these symptoms, then they should come down a level on their nicotine replacement therapy. But often, the vast majority of the problem is that people are underdosing nicotine replacement therapy. It's not, I never hear about people who are overshooting it and then coming down. It's always that people are not quite using enough of it. There are, just to be complete, there are other options for nicotine replacement therapy that I actually don't prescribe because they require, at least for my insurance companies, they require prior, prior authorizations. They're, um, I think, sort of level two in terms of smoking cessation therapy from, for what a pediatrician is doing. The patch and the gum and the lozenge, because they're available over the counter, they're really easy to use. They're um, supported by the quit lines. These things are a little bit more complicated, so know that they're out there and they are effective. But I would, again, if someone's having a lot of trouble quitting, then try and get them connected to the quit line or to their PMD. The other medications you've probably heard of are Reditin and Bupropion. 
Again, as a pediatrician, if this is not my primary patient, I would be wary of prescribing either of these medications to them. But just so that you know that they're out there, so if someone's like, I'm really having trouble, Doc, what do I do? Um, you can, there are other, you can tell them there are other medication options out there and they can uh, help hopefully connect them with the primary care provider. And then the third step, so we did ask, we did assist, we did connect, I'm sorry, we are doing connect right now. The third step is to connect people to phone counseling. So again, like I said, we don't have very long in the office with people who are smokers because we're doing, we don't have very long to talk about smoking because we're talking about breastfeeding and obesity and nutrition and school and ADHD and IEPs and all these other things. So I try to get the conversation started. I try to assess whether they're interested in quitting smoking or not. If they're not, I say, I'm always here in case you want to talk to me about this. And if they are interested, I get them their NRT and I connect them to our quit line and then I move on. So the quit line I think is a really, really important partner with us as we're thinking about doing these interventions. The way that this works on the inpatient setting as well, sometimes you have a little bit more time because the families are kind of captive audiences there while their kids are getting their you know, Q2 hour nebs. Um, so sometimes you have a little bit more time and what we've been doing at UCSF is our respiratory therapy team has actually taken this project on. So when we have a child who comes in who is having secondhand smoke exposure and if the parent does, sometimes the parent's not always at the bedside, but if the smoking parent is at the bedside, then the RT team comes in and they do a lot of this counseling and they offer nicotine replacement therapy and this connection to the state quit line as well. So if you're interested on the inpatient side, we have a couple of models in, um, on the mainland that are working well. One at UC and one at the University of Colorado. Um, you guys also have a huge number of smoking groups available. So on the psquam.org, I was going to put up all of the groups, but there were too many and then it would have been one of those slides that you can't read because there are too many things on it. So in lieu of that, I just put up the website. There are a ton of groups available there. For some people, in-person groups are really attractive and for some people, they can't get away from the kids long enough to you know, even go grocery shopping. So it's nice to know that there are different options to offer families based on what their, uh, what their interest in availability are. When I, I was saying this yesterday, that when I started doing this, I was all about, get people the NRT and don't worry about the counseling. And then I <laughs> realized that I was doing a bad thing. So we know that both medication and counseling, if people use both of those, they have, they, it doubles their, uh, the likelihood that they will stay quit at six months. And so I think it's really important for us to offer both the NRT and the counseling. And full disclosure and all honesty, usually when I have this conversation, a lot of parents are like, yes, I'll take the NRT, and oh, I think I can do it myself without counseling. Um, so I, I have many more people accept the nicotine replacement therapy than I do have accept the behavioral counseling. And I just, I tell them, you know, it's gonna, it's really gonna help if you add the counseling to the medication, but people will do what they wanna do. And so the best you can do is put it out there and give them the resources. Um, the thing I wanted to point out here, a couple things. One is that I think one of our great assumptions is that if someone's smoking, it's because they wanna be smoking and like, it's kind of none of my business and it's kind of a sensitive topic, so I'm not really gonna talk about it with them. But we know that smokers actually expect us to talk about this and particularly parents of our pediatric patients expect us to bring this up. And by not bringing it up, we're, we're being a little bit um, permissive and saying like, I'm not gonna talk about that. And, and we're sending the message that it's not that important. And we know that secondhand smoke exposure is extremely important. So I think even, even um, just asking about quitting smoking and interest in quitting smoking doubles quit attempts because people know that someone that they respect who's looking out for their kid is interested in whether or not they're smoking and that sends a message to people. If you are interested in getting trained, so this, um, with a grant from First Five California, we were able to train about 100 clinics across the state of California. Um, and we did these in, I was telling Anna yesterday, we did these in-person trainings where my partner or I would fly out to like LA or San Diego or San Bernardino and we would go to a clinic and spend an hour basically doing this talk. And then we'd leave them with one of those toolkits and some posters and say like, okay, now you can do C's. Um, as you can imagine, that was very expensive and time consuming. And I have two kids and I was like, I can't be flying all over the state to do this. So we actually got a grant from the AAP and developed an online training module which we did a little quick research study on. We enrolled 15 clinics, divided them into an online training group and an in-person training group, and basically found that the online group is, is equivalent to the in-person training. 
People like the in-person trainees better because my partner always made lemon bars for people, so she would bring them lemon bars. And I was like, my online training module can't give you lemon bars, but it's a heck of a lot cheaper than us flying around the state. So the good news is that we do have this online module available now. It's on the website. It's, it's easy to find if you just click on the health providers link on the website. Um, it's free. You can get CME or CEU credit. And the way that we have, um, the way that I recommend people do this, it's a 25-minute training module. So I recommend that if you're interested with, with your inpatient board team or with your clinic team, have everybody do the online module, 25 minutes of their time, and then come together for 20 minutes and just talk about what this implementation might look like in your clinic. Like who's gonna ask, where are you gonna stop the nicotine replacement therapy prescriptions, just to make sure everybody's on the same page. In my clinic, we, um, we found it really important to train the medical assistants and the nurses as well because I only spend, you know, by the time I get into the room as the attending, I spend maybe five or 10 minutes in the room with them after the resident has seen the patient. Whereas if the patient is sitting in the waiting room or waiting for vaccines, they're talking, they have a lot more exposure to the medical assistant. And so we realized that having the medical assistants and the nurses be on board with what was going on was actually more important sometimes than having the providers know what's going on. That's just a picture of the online training. It's really fun. And we were, I was very proud of it. <laughs> it's interactive. You can like mouse over and click on things. It's, it's, uh, we tried to make it fun. OK, we talked about that. Um, there are a bunch of support tools that you can download from CCalifornia.org if you're interested. Everything is free. And if you want to download something and change it and use it for your clinic, please feel free. All we want to do is get the information out there, and especially because the smoking rate here is so high, we just really want to make this information available to anybody. Feel free to do whatever you want to it. The only thing we ask is that if you make a change and you're like, this is awesome, let us know so we can add that to the website and make it available for other people. Okay, I'm gonna switch. How much time do I have left? I'm okay, okay. Did you have a question? Oh, sorry, okay. Uh, I'm gonna switch gears and talk about vaping. But I think this might be a good minute if people have questions about cease to ask any of those. Or else I can go on, yeah, yeah. How do you approach the behavioral aspect of these activities? Because smoking is also about just the behavior. Huge.